Good morning, everybody. Thank you to um, the sponsors. A uh, very special thank you to Mr. Killich, who has been become a dear colleague and for all the hard work in bringing everyone together. Thank you for being here. And I will just say a very few brief remarks. I thought the video was very timely because I wanted to mention that in August, I went to South Korea. And in the trip, I um, met with a fashion designer, and Mrs. Lee. And in sort of a side um, work that she's doing, she's been going to Sudan to develop um, education programs there. But when she first went, she realized that it was they needed, the people there were very poor, they needed shelter, and they needed food. So she started a program called Himango, and um, giving mango trees so that they could have shelter and as well as food. And um, she, coming from a very uh, strong evangelical Christian belief that it's important to take care of holistic needs, which I know many of us would agree with. So I think it's very timely of the, about the trees and the video, but also how important for governments and in their role and their leadership to um, help with education and peacekeeping and peace building. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first um, presenter, our first honorable speaker. It's um, the Honorable Armin Luestra, who is the Minister of Education of the Philippines. He's also a Filipino Lasallian brother, and he started teaching religion, as a religion teacher at De La Salle Lipa in 1983. He was made provincial of the De La Salle Brothers Philippine District in 1997, a post he held in two, until 2003. In August 2000, Minister Luestra co-founded the De La Salle Catholic University of Manado, currently known as De La Salle University System, consequently making him the president of eight De La Salle institutions. He was appointed as the Secretary of Education in June 2010. The minister is a major proponent of the K plus 12 basic education program in the Philippines and the program seeks to add two years to the current 10-year basic education curriculum. Please join me in welcoming the minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. I bring with you the greetings of all my, my Filipino friends and, and, and students from the 7,100 islands of the Philippines. Peace, assalamu alaikum. Uh, greetings to, to all of you. To, to my co-panelists, it's a privilege to join you this morning. But let me just focus on peace building and violence on children. Let me begin by uh, my talk by borrowing the words of the former United Nations uh, Secretary General, Kofi Annan, who is quoted to have once said, education is quite simply peace building by another name. It is the most effective form of defense spending there is. All of us hope that there will be more budget in education more than in armaments. This statement may well summarize what this forum is all about. And I imagine that one good reason we have come from different parts of the globe is to gather, to gather today is that all of us firmly believe in this statement. We believe that education holds the key to attaining a more peaceful and harmonious global community. In which case, we, as staunch proponents of education, are here to work together to find ways to turn this opportunity into concrete reality and to overcome the obstacles that prevent us from realizing this goal. The child is our context. The perspective which I wish to bring into this discussion revolves around the disturbing reality of violence in our schools and, more specifically, violence against children. The individual child remains at the center of our attention. The synopsis describing this conference states it very well. No matter what the scale of conflict is, at the core of it lies the individual. It is the individual that makes the decision between hating and not hating. The individual that prevents millions of others from enjoying their birthright freedoms. And it will be an individual that will make the decision to either cause or prevent a nuclear disaster that can, God forbid, perish the nations. The individual lies at the core of every conflict. 
One approach, I think, is to pay closer attention to what we teach our children, the content of our lessons and activities. Are we equipping the young with the right morals and skill sets that will prepare them to face a world that is sadly broken and wounded? The other approach is to review the how we teach our children. Are our pedagogical techniques still relevant to the unique needs of this new generation? Are we promoting the right values in the way we encourage competition, cooperation, achievement, and accomplishment? In addition to these, however, is the inevitable consideration of the child's context, his home, family, school, peers, and community. Are we sustaining the proper environment that fosters creativity, self-acceptance, cooperation, and purpose? Are we responsive to the many flaws in the system and relationships that weave through the child's several delicate connections to himself, herself, and the community? If we dare hope to establish peace among nations and among societies, we lawmakers, administrators, educators, and other stakeholders first need to ask ourselves how effective we are in promoting peace in our classrooms and in our school grounds and campuses. And while primarily we may imagine violence in schools as that which describes a crazed student shooting down his peers and professors with a, with a rifle, we may easily overlook or dismiss the more subtle forms of violence in our institutions. Bullying, verbal abuse, peer pressure, and other psychological abuses inflict up inflicted upon a young child, which all contribute to the developing psyche of the individual. It is this individual who then grows up to possibly become a peace-loving and leader or a power-hungry and ruthless tyrant, whether it be in the context of politics, religion, business, or simply the family and home. A study conducted by the National Centers for Injury Prevention and Control and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, entitled Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, this is in 2006, has reported that although the consequences of violence for children may vary according to its nature and severity, the short and long-term repercussions are very often grave and damaging. Violence may result in greater susceptibility to long life, to lifelong social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, and to health risk behaviors. Related mental health and social problems include anxiety and depressive disorders, hallucinations, impaired work performance, memory disturbances, as well as aggressive behavior. Violence against children definitely feeds into the ruthless cycle of violence which pervades our societies. Dear friends, the world is a giant playground. As the expression goes, the world is a giant playground. Watch what happens in our school grounds and we get a pretty accurate picture of what is occurring at a much larger scale in the global arena. In my, team, in my term as Minister of Education in the Philippines over the past two years, I have been confronted by the many sad and shocking cases in schools of violence against children, not only by adults, but more appallingly by their fellow youth. For instance, there was this case in a school in Iloilo, Central Philippines, two months ago, of a first grade pupil, seven years old, who was brutally, brutally killed by a fifth grader. It was reported that the first grader took a marble of the nine-year-old during a game. The older boy chased the little boy and upon capturing him, repeat, repeatedly hit the bleeding head of the victim using a rock behind one of the comfort, comfort rooms in the school premises. In another more recent incident in my own hometown in Batangas, a fist fight between two high school students occurred in the classroom with the, with the teacher present. The victim was hit on his head and he subsequently died in the hospital. These are horrifying cases of actual names and faces of students, one in, in the primary, the other in the secondary, in the Philippines. 
The big question I ask myself and yourselves is what is the most appropriate response in each case? In the many other incidents of violence between children, the young perpetrators are not surprisingly victims of violence themselves, and you're very aware of that ruthless cycle. The degree to which they have received violence varies. According to the findings of the UN Secretary General's study on violence in children, they say that the majority of violent, violent acts experienced by children is perpetrated by people who are part of their lives. Parents, schoolmates, teachers, employers, boyfriends or girlfriends, spouses, and partners. In the context of the home and family, the study states that, and I quote, violence against children in the family may frequently take, care, take place in the context of discipline and takes the form of physical, cruel, or humiliating punishment. Harsh treatment and punishment in the family are common both in industrialized and developing countries. Children, as reported in the study, speaking for themselves, highlighted the physical and psychological hurt they suffer as a result of these forms of treatment and proposed positive and effective alternative forms of discipline. Now taking this into consideration, how we deal with these perpetrators, how we deliver punishment, likewise becomes both an opportunity and a challenge for us to re-educate these offending victims with the purpose of attending to their own woundedness for healing. They too are victims. They need proper attention and accompaniment. No easy task. Returning to the context of education, how do we transform our playground, our school grounds, into oases of fun and recreation, safety and security? Our schools regretfully contribute to the violence done to children. And a few examples, violence perpetrated by teachers and other school staff with or without the overt or tacit approval of education ministries, cruel humiliating forms of psychological punishment, sexual, gender-based violence, bullying, corporal punishment, beating, caning, is still a practice in several of our schools. Violence in schools in the form of playground fighting and bullying of students also occurs. You're pretty aware of that. F bullying is frequently associated with discrimination against students from poor families, ethnically or marginalized groups, or with particular characteristics, physical or mental disability. It could be verbal, physical, and it affects the wider community. For example, in gang culture and gang-related criminal activity, particularly related to drugs. Of course, sexual and gender-based violence occurs very much in, in educational settings. Much is directed against girls male by male teachers and classmates. Violence also directed against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered young people. How does government and what is our failure in terms of enacting laws that, are ex that explicitly protect these individuals. The same study says that in most countries, children spend more time in the care of adults in educational settings than outside the home. These kind of further exacerbating the problem. We have a real and urgent responsibility to improve conditions in our schools. The world is a giant playground transform the playground, and we transform the world. Once we move closer to attaining this progress in our educational institutions, I believe we would have taken a significant giant step toward building peace in the world. One problem is a disconnected lesson to the world. For example, in addition to this task of creating a safe haven for children, we need to, reg to realize the huge gap that lies between what we teach our children and what they learn from the world. In our efforts to uh, educate our children, we have to keep recognizing the University of Hard Knocks and the School of Reality. What happens in the classroom when we teach the child to share, but she returns home and experiences outright the refusal of her older sister to share a cookie? What happens when in the classroom we speak of loving their enemies, but upon surfing the internet or watching television, our same students witness revenge and bloodshed 
Victory to the sole survivor, survival of the fittest, heroism in conquering through violence. These are not raw issues. They have been discussed in many fora, past and present. It is a reality we can no longer continue skimming and ignoring. As we congregate here to discuss ways to build peace through education, we need to return to the question of how effective our lessons are in the face of what is out there. How do we link a disconnected lesson to the realities of the world? How do we encourage children to cross the blurred line from living hard reality to striving for the ideal? And what is our responsibility? I propose that we need a new paradigm in education. I believe discussions on paradigms in education are of primary importance. We may be propagating methods which are no longer relevant. For example, I realize that in the Philippines, our pre-colonial heritage is one that is naturally cooperative, community-centered, and not at all con competitive. We have in the Philippines, for example, a, a spirit which we call bayanihan, or the spirit of community effort. We can only move mountains if we work together. But being a colonial, uh, uh, being under a, a, a colony, the country continues to adopt a very Western style of education. We encourage now a lot of competition, survival of the fittest, a lot of contests even in our schools, and then in the name of achievement and success. Well, there is nothing inherently wrong in this, it may not align with the deeper movement of our people's soul. Learning, development, and psychology, and there may be a strong need for us to return to our more traditional Asian values and to translate this into the curriculum and, pedagog and pedagogy. Perhaps in education and in sports, we revolve around competition and winning, and we train our students to do exactly the same in the real world. We may need to move towards another paradigm of co-opetition rather than competition. Activities that are equally fun, where winning continues to be possible, especially when it encourages genuine teamwork and good sportsmanship. These and many other potential solutions need to be explored with the hope of minimizing the violence that we see in the playground and in the world. In summary, I will end with two stories. The peace we seek to build in the world truly has to begin in our schools. We cannot deny the interconnectedness of violence that happens in our campuses against that what is transpiring in nations and in the world. We begin by peace and the peace of this one boy, Kez Valdez, a finalist, and last week I found out, won the International Children's Peace Prize in the Netherlands. His story started when he was five years old. Kez was a street child, used to live near a dump site. He was tasked to scavenge from the huge pile of garbage to earn money. One particular day, while the garbage trucks were unloading, the kids from the dump site sprinted to, the, to be the first to get the best scavenge there are. A boy pushed Kez aside, and accidentally he fell into a burning tire. He sustained serious burns, and to top it all, his parents, finding about the incident, gave Kez away into an orphanage with the belief that he is an unlucky child. Despite everything that has happened to him, he had an unyielding desire to help kids like him. Last year, during the Typhoon Sendong in the Philippines, Kez, 13 years old, set up the organization Championing Community Children. His aim is to give children hope and show them that they can take their future into their own hands. He gives them hope gifts, packages of slippers, clothing, soap, toothbrushes, and toys. He holds regular speeches at 13 years old. He launched Championing Community Children in 2005, distributed 5,000 hope gifts, and helped over 10,000 children in the Philippines through the program set up by, by, by himself. He is a victim of violence, but he was able to cut that chain, the cycle of violence. But the story does not end there. Kez, as a street child, 
was adapted by another Filipino CNN hero, Efren Peña Florida, who himself was a street child. He founded Dynamic Teen Company, and in 2009, he, he started with his group to distribute uh, and go to locations such as slums, trash dumps, and cemeteries, where a lot of our children live, distributing cards of books and notepads, crayons and pens, recreating the class and bringing the class room into where they are. Two stories of two Filipinos, both um, experiencing violence, able to live that hope within the human heart. I leave you with these stories because we can lose everything. We can experience all the violence we see in the world but we dare not lose the hope that we find in the heart of Kez and in the heart of Efren Peña Florida. Let me just end with uh, uh, this paradigm that we need to ensure we will be getting, that in fact, children need not be recipients of our peace initiatives. They can be, in fact, the initiators of the peace that we want to see. Let me end with this quotation from um, uh, Landon Pearson, director of the Pearson Resource Center, who says, nations will not prosper if their children do not heal. To suffer violence in childhood is to be wounded in the soul, if not, and if not healed, to go on to inflict pain on others as well. No child should be a victim of violence. All children should have the right to protection and to first call on their nation's resources. The time to fulfill their rights is now. Have a blessed morning. Peace to all.